Welcome to my review and thoughts of the second made-for-TV Ewok movie, Ewoks, The Battle for Endor. This movie's from 1985, and yeah, I actually kind of liked this one. Um, yeah. And uh, the, the video will have some jokes, none at the expense of members of minorities. We'll get into some serious topics. Now, if you're looking for a review that talks about, oh, um, the movie doesn't really hold up, it's been outdone by little movies because that is not that much fun to watch today. Whether you agree with that assessment or not, this is not that review. And, yeah, this is currently on Disney+, Plus, at least here in Western Europe. So, I don't particularly like the Ewoks being in Return of the Jedi, but that's especially because the movie is for ages 12 and up, and the Ewoks with ease defeat a significant contingent of the Empire's elite troops. In these two made-for-TV Ewok movies, it's clear the children are the target audience, and the Ewoks go on adventures that feel like they fit Ewoks better, so it really doesn't bother me that they're centered on Ewoks. And, uh, yeah, I realize this video is long. I'm doing what I can to make it worth your time. The start, I start the video with a review where if I spoil anything, I'll verbally warn for a do so. Hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoiler so you can mute and skip ahead and choose to lower my index finger. I probably won't do any spoilers in the review itself. Also, please note, I will not warn before spoilers for earlier entries in this franchise. Not ones released later, but set earlier. Only ones released earlier. Even if they, at least some of them are apparently set later. Let's see. And as soon as I end the review itself, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers, including discussing the ending. And yeah, so this movie is rated TVG. And I mean, I guess I can kind of understand. I think a PG makes more sense. And it is also rated. Let's see, Singapore has it as PG, West Germany has it as ages 12 and up, Sweden has it as ages 15 and up, holy crap. Um, Finland has it as ages 14 and up, so yeah. I would definitely say there are... I could understand showing it to your kids, but maybe like wait until they're like 8 or 9 and maybe watch it first so make sure that you don't think it's too intense or you know there are some really good descriptions on uh, there's there's not a lot on the IMDb parents guide for the movie but they do describe some of the most intense stuff and yeah i mean i do think it would probably have made more sense for them to not go as dark as it does, but I, I respect it. It's very metal. I, I, like, I knew because people, I read it in reviews of the first movie, I knew that this one was more intense than the first one. Did not expect it to get as, like, it's still not, you know, if you're used to R-rated movies, it's not that intense. But for a kid's movie, fairly intense. I have watched this movie once. I just got done watching it before I hit record. And yeah, uh, so the plot. I'm going to be quoting IMDb here. Marauders raid the Ewok village, steal a power supply they believe to be magical. Wicket helps Sindel escape the evil witch Sharal. And they befriend a hermit who may help them save the village. And... Yeah, that brings us to... Yeah, so this was written by the brothers Ken and Jim Wheat. And George Lucas wrote the story for it. You know, not the... Yeah, not not the nitty-gritty details. But the, the story itself he did write. And... Uh, yeah, uh, the Wheat brothers did also direct the movie together, except for Wilford Brimley scenes because he could not stand them. So those were handled by Joe Johnston, American hero, and not just for this. But but yeah, um, the writing like. There are some things about this that are actually kind of well-written. Like, there's some things that are definitely 
you know, it's very much, it, it relies on some fairy tale logic, which is, of course, not what everybody wants from Star Wars. And some characters are very one note, but there are some, some choices that I really appreciate. I suppose, okay, the following might not be a writing, it might have been a directing decision, but, you know, it's the same two brothers who did both. Most of the time, the Marauders have no language. And I don't mean, oh, you know, they speak, you know, they're, they're, it goes unsubtitled. It does when they do speak. But most of the time, they're not making any intelligible words. Like, they are growling and grumbling and groaning, but they don't say things that we in any way could understand. So they feel like animals. And this, of course... You know, again, if you're used to R-rated movies, it's not, like, scary, but for the kids, it can be kind of scary. You know, there's no way to really relate to the Marauders m most of the time, most of their screen time. They just feel like, yeah, you know, they might as well, like, you can relate to the Marauders about as much as you can relate to what they call the, the Death Hounds from Willow, you know, just, there's, you, you really can't get any any kind of rapport with them and just yeah I you know considering that they do like they do emit noises this is not like the Gorak of the first there's a you know there's a lot of creatures in Star Wars that you wouldn't expect to be able to you know form words but the the and and you know speak in any kind of intelligent way but the the yeah here it was a choice and i really appreciate it and uh, yeah um that's about it for the writing of this movie as for writing in general please support the sack after strike there's a link to donate in the description box and some links that explain why the strike is so important now the movie Right, I'm, yeah, before I get too much into the direction, um, yeah, I've ranked all of the Star Wars films worst to best, including the first Ewok movie. At the end of the review itself, I'll update this ranking with this second Ewok movie. But, but yeah, worst to best, uh, the, the, you know, it's, yeah, episodes 2, 3, 1, 9, Ewok movie 1, episode 6, Solo, Episode 7, Rogue One, Episodes 4, 5, and 8. And, yeah, so the evil marauders are on Endor because their ship crashed. Their reliance on magic and poor understanding of technology means they haven't been able to fix their ship and leave. Now, at first, this might sound like it's demonizing people who do not understand technology well, like many indigenous peoples, and that was part of how colonization was justified. We didn't like what the indigenous people were doing, so we killed and slaved them and stole their land over it, and certainly would not be the first or last time Lucas coded indigenous people as evil. The sand people are clearly coded as Native Americans, and they're basically seen as these primitives that you can't peacefully coexist with. One of the relatively few good things about the Book of Boba Fett was its efforts to retcon this. Anyway, I don't think this is a case of Lucas demonizing them. It strikes me more as a message of making the most of your situation, you know, and, and yeah, choosing good. You know, the Ewoks are peaceful, so the Marauders could have easily lived in harmony with them. Sindel and her family do. And this is the kind of thing that indigenous people do, as opposed to turning to evil to take control of your situation, murdering and kidnapping people, you know, in, in, yeah, in order to take, yeah, in order to return to the way things were for you. That's how a lot of modern religious people, especially monotheists, you know, commit a lot of evil acts, including murder and slavery. And it is also reminiscent of rich people literally destroying the planet, killing us all slowly, and a few people very abruptly, through lack of regulation in their factories and such, just because they want more money, a bigger house, more bedrooms. Now, in the first movie, it seemed like they finally took a break from Star Wars protagonists, needing their parents to be either dead or messed up in some way, you know, we got some subversion, so this doubled down instead, and opens with multiple parent death. And, uh, yeah, the effects here were handled by ILM, like Caravan of Courage, and it's again this thing of, 
you you can tell when they switch between puppets and um, stop motion but there's still some pretty good puppets and slow stop stop motion and yeah it's you know there's there's a pretty good amount of creatures in this i was quite happy with how you know for for a tv movie you know it's not you know doesn't make sense to compare it to like the original trilogy of you know but yeah there's a there's a pretty decent amount of of creatures here and yeah, in part, it's to sell toys, definitely. But they they did a pretty good job, you know. I I I watched this for the creatures, and I stayed for the for the battle. To, you know, it's pretty decent action, also. And uh, yeah, so no spoilers. But on at least one occasion in this, when a villain makes a threat, we see evidence it has been carried out before. Show don't tell. Now, this movie is much darker than the first one. If the first one is looking at darkness through a keyhole, and every Star Wars movie that isn't an Ewok movie is a partially open door into darkness, then this one opens all the way, blows it off the hinges, the door sucked into the abyss. It is approaching being as dark as the first never-ending story. Like, it is... Yeah. Sindel is not the first Star Wars protagonist to lose their parents. But, like, this is... For for a kid's film, this is brutal. It gets very... yeah. Now, um, yeah, so I have some critic quotes. One person points out, you can barely tell the Marauders are tall, which apparently, like, I, I read that they hired people that were of a very, you know, especially tall. You know, Carol Streakin who you may know as Lurch, and he also appears briefly in the first Men in Black movie, plays the, the Marauder leader, Terak, and he's not the only tall one. They, they seem like they're all tall, but the problem is, a lot of the time, like, they're around Ewoks, which makes it difficult, you know, like, to compared to an Ewok, they don't look, like, extremely tall. They kind of just look you know, of, of average size, they, like, not dwarf actors, and, you know, a lot of the time, they're, yeah, they'll maybe be around, you know, when they're around Ewok buildings, you know, same problem as I just was talking about Ewoks, and when they're at their own place, everything has been built to their size, so you can't really tell that, well, it's, it's, it's a, it's one of those things, it's a good idea in theory, but in practice, you can't really tell, and and that's that's really too bad, you know. Like the there there are not very many, you know. Sindel is one of the only non dwarf actors who gets a lot of screen time in this, it's especially where you see her near Marauders, and she's a child. She's not them, you know. She's about the same, you know, height as the Ewoks, so, you know, there, there is the witch Sharal, but there's not that much time where she's standing so that you can really compare height. There's, there's this one scene where it's like, okay, finally, we can compare heights, because she's right, you know, she's very, very close to Tarak, but Tarak is sitting down, so we still don't get a strong impression of it, it's just, yeah, and... Uh, yeah, uh, multiple people have pointed out, how do ships keep crashing on Endor? I'm starting to suspect it might have been the only way to land there at, at the time. Just, yeah. Now, yeah, compared to the first one, this actually has a plot, and yeah, they do a really good, like, I don't know exactly, I haven't seen anything that specifies it, but it feels like, Lucas and, and the others sat and watched the original and took notes and were like, okay, how can we make the second one better? Because the first one, you know, basically both of them open pretty much the same way. Just scope is the is the difference, which is also like, maybe it wasn't so bad that we only got two of these if they were going to keep starting. Like, okay, Sindel... I suppose, yeah, yeah, Sindel and or her family are 
attacked, someone is captured, and, you know, yeah, Sindel is, is more or less on her own. She's with at least one Ewok, and she has to try to, to you know, fix the situation. But the, the, where the first one very rarely cuts to, to the, the parents having been captured, this one will every so often, you know, it's not like constantly, but I'm not sure more than 20 minutes ever pass between two times where we see Marauders, or at the very least, Sharal. And... Yeah, you know, they'll they'll cut to the the marauders and it'll it'll bring back up, you know, they're they're looking for the power. I want the power. I have the power. And just the like in this movie you never truly forget that. And and I suppose an argument could be made that there's a little bit of an episodic nature to this, but not to the extent that there was in the first. And where, just, yeah, in the first, like, Sindel being sick, literally, and I do, I'm not exaggerating, it's there because otherwise the movie wouldn't reach feature length. Like, George Lucas envisioned it as, like, a, I want to say it was half hour, half hour, 45 minutes, something like that. And, you know... The, the the word back was, nope, has to be, you know, you have to have 90 minutes of material so that with commercials it becomes a two-hour, you know, broadcast. So they just added in more stuff. And Sindel being sick, you know, it uh, she trusts the Ewoks before. Mace doesn't trust them before or after, so it changes nothing. You could literally write that out, and you would lose absolutely nothing. And in this, like early on, you know, they they meet this this hermit, but it does, and and you know, at first he doesn't really want them around, but it is like this fairly relevant, like the you know they can't the the they can't go back to the village, so they need a new place to stay, and this hermit's house seems like it would work out well for, for everyone. So it is progressing the, the plot. You know, if you just, like, went directly from the start to them being friends with the hermit, that would not feel organic. That would feel very forced, you know. And there are no Jedi in this. So that wouldn't make any sense. Who would be using the force? So the the yeah, it's it's a uh, yeah. Every so often it'll cut back and we see how like Sharal, you know, basically being forced to to try to make this power thing happen, and basically like she knows, she suspects that Sindel knows. Because, you know, that. What can I say? This is what happens when your galaxy closes down the last, you know, Radio Shack. You gotta go to the first human kid you see and ask them, how do I operate this part of a, of a starship? You know, this is. This is just how you handle these things. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not, you know, telling you anything you don't know here. Now, but, but yeah, the fact that it does have this, this through line of the marauders, that the threat they pose, and this drive to, to get power, yeah, like, it never feels like it's just this episodic thing. It, it, there's a, I mean, essentially, the first chunk of the movie is Sindel and Wicket recovering from the attack. You know, you don't expect them to immediately encounter the Marauders again. You know, they need to, to you know, they literally, she just lost her entire family. 
and and the rest of you know we could lost the rest of the Ewoks the village is destroyed you know there's no you know th things have completely been upended of course they need a little time to figure things out and you know yeah uh, so yeah back to critic quotes bigger better action absolutely true less bad acting still great effects Wicked is almost the only Ewok who gets to do stuff in this one. I don't know if, like, maybe, you know, don't get me wrong. Warwick Davis, in literally anything I see him in, always great. Like, I'm always happy to see him in stuff. Maybe he was the one person who won the bet. Maybe he lost the bet and the, it was considered punishment, but he's like... Yeah, the, the, the others are captured for a lot of it, and yeah, it's just, I mean, the movie's called Ewok, you know, plural. Anyway, um, right, it gets inspiration from uh, Return of the Jedi, Wizard of Oz, the mere presence of Wilfred Brimley is even a repetition of sorts, as Brimley serves much the same purpose as Alicanus in A New Hope. Although I don't mean to say Brimley is up to the level of performer that Guinness is, he's a confident actor who balances against the more fantastic elements of the story and world. One of the greatest weaknesses of Caravan of Courage is that it has no steadying presence in terms of human performances. Aubrey Miller is adorable as Sindel, but she's too small and experienced to set the film's tone, nor should she be expected to. Thus, the film defaults to having Mace be the normalizing presence for the viewer, the person who we experience the story through, but he's a disastrous character, so the effect is ruined. In contrast, Brimley is a strong performer with an affable effect that registers strongly with both children and adults. He doesn't condescend to the material, even as he doesn't play wide-eyed wonder at the special effects on display. Instead, he simply serves as a rock bed of support for all Brie Miller, Warwick Davis, and Nikki Botello to play off of. Nikki Botello plays the character Teak, who is Noah, the, the Wilford Brimley char hermit character Noah's pet? Adoptive son? I don't know. Uh, he's They live in the same place. And at one point, Noah says, I made you I made you your bed, not not like put the covers on. No, no, I, he like built from from like forest stuff. He made a new bed, so like clearly there's some you know he cares about Teak, but it's not completely. Cl it's also not entirely clear if Teak is like on the same intelligence level as Noah or more like one of the creatures. So. But, yeah, you know, and some, some kids, it's, you know, I don't mind the character. The, the character of Teak is fun. Now, depending on, like, some kids thought the Teak was the most adorable thing in the world, rushed out to get the toy. Others say that he's nightmare fuel. I, honestly, I, I thought he was pretty cute. I, I, I can understand why you would think nightmare fuel, though. Um... It is what, like, there is this thing where, like, Teak meets Wicked and Sindel and, like, wants them to follow Teak, but speed, run, like, I, I get that Teak is capable of it, and maybe it's one of those things where, like, you know, if you could run that fast, you would do it all the time. But Teak is also capable of moving at normal speeds, and like instead is like, zzz, and they're like, where, where did they? Go? Oh, okay, there they are. Which I guess for the kids is like appealing, like more grown-up peekaboo, I guess. But like, I don't know. I'm just sitting here as an adult, like, um, you know that they're unhoused. You're trying to help them. Why are you being a jerk about it? Like, just let them follow you in a more... Or, like, maybe, like, carry at least one of them. At least some of the way. They, they are clearly very tired. And Teak seems like... Like they can handle that. Anyway. Let's see. But, but yeah, so back to critical quotes. They don't need to play too serious since Brimley is anchoring that aspect of the film. 
the very worst tendencies in Peter Bernstein's score, which is never as successful as John Williams' pastiche here as it was in the Ewok Adventure, which swings from generally acceptable adventure movie boilerplate cribbing over overtly from Night on Bald, Bald Mountain at its best to this god-awful happy jangly tosh, addle-headed summer elevator music that would be better suited to a Euro smut film or a commercial about adult diapers than a sci-fi fantasy. Ouch! How? Show me where on the doll he hurt you, jeez. But yeah, um, it's not great. Let's see. Um... The Battle for Endor has all but given up any pretense of existing in the Star Wars universe, so I'm probably overreacting. It's basically gone completely over to fantasy at this point, with a witch that can transform into a crow, and a medieval-style castle on a bluff, complete with dangerous moat and all that. Most of the ele elements of Willow that Lucas hadn't finished modeling in the Ewok adventure, he took care of here. Most transparently, a sorceress dressed in sleek black, screaming... Find me that child! What in all of God's creation this has to do with Return of the Jedi, I could not say. Yeah, this is definitely the, the you know, maybe that's why there isn't a third Ewok movie. They made Willow instead. Like, just, they got real, real close to, to Willow here. It's, it's, um, yeah. Let's see. And yeah, one person has undoing the good of the first installment to fit Sindel into the Heidi role is very unfortunate, as they could have easily cast a new young actress for an altogether newer role. That is very true. It's like I I understand that Lucas got the idea here from watching Heidi after they made the first movie, and he wanted to, and I think. I forget if it's this one, the first one, or maybe both, but at least one of these was Lucas's gift to, I forget if it was one of his own children, or it was like a child who he was related to, but but yeah, you know, and I mean, it goes better than when Robert Rodriguez tries um, to be, I, I'm referring mostly to Shark I feel bad even saying it out loud. Shark Boy and Lava Girl. I don't know why I watched it. It was a mistake. I, th I think I was just like, okay, it's Robert Rodriguez. How bad could it be? And, you know, got the answer pretty quick. Uh, I watched that and the first, honestly, the first Spy Kids, it's fine for what it is, you know. But I have heard that the Spy Kids sequels are, are much, much worse. Anyway, but yeah. So Lucas wanted a Heidi movie. Uh, I'm guessing the kid already liked Ewoks. I, you know, a lot of kids in the 80s did. But yeah, you could have just... This didn't have to be related to the first movie at all. Uh, at least it didn't have to have, like... You know, for, actually, yeah, you could have started this with Sindel leaving Endor with her family which, you know, she was reunited with at the end of the first movie. The, the entire first movie was, oh, is she, are she and Mace going to be able to get their parents back? And then they just die here, you know. Yeah, um, you know, have them f fly away. Maybe they, on the way, they pass another Star Cruiser, which crashes because that's what Endor does to, to ships in these couple of Ewok movies. And the, the... You know, maybe the girl on the other ship was traveling by herself. Let's go. Let's call her Heidi. Heidi maybe was, uh, was traveling by herself. Maybe her parents died in the crash. Something. But to to render the entire first movie, like honestly, if you're if if you feel like watching at least one of these, you're not entirely sold up. Maybe just watch this one. You don't really need to watch the first in order to appreciate this one. And if you get super into the first one, and then you watch this, you might really feel like the first one was a complete waste of your time. Now, let's 
right, so back to critical quotes. That said, Aubrey Miller is a sweetheart, and it is rather nice to see her again, especially as Sindel's friendship with Wicked the Ewok continues to grow. Wicked W. Warwick has been played in costume by Warwick Davis in all three Star Wars movies to feature him. Let's see. Uh, but but did you know it was Daryl Henriques who voiced Wicked in the two Ewok spin-off films? The actor is best known to sci-fi fans as the Romulan ambassador Nankless in Star Trek VI The Undiscovered Country. Personally, I'm still wondering why Lucas had Wicked talk at all. You don't have to understand a pet dog to be his friend and life companion. And yeah, you know, the the that is kind of the relationship. Sindel barely, yeah, some, some say Sindel barely shows any grief over losing her family, some of them dying right in front of her even though she's like five years old. Others correctly point out Sindel shows clear evidence of PTSD. Like for chunks of it, she's essentially like almost in denial, like she's trying not to, because it is like, you know, she lost everything. Like her entire family died and she has no one to, to, you know, like at that age, you still need someone to take care of you. She has no one to do that. So just, yeah. And she actually, she has this nightmare that like, you could maybe say, oh, you know, she's a kid. She had a bad experience. She has a nightmare. I would classify it as a PTSD nightmare. Let's see, considering the context. I'm not saying that if you have a nightmare similar to that, that means that it's PTSD. Now, Sharal was retconned as a Dathomiri night sister. And uh, yeah, the critic goes on note, is also a scary villain for young viewers. And yeah, awesome. Clone Wars is some of the best Star Wars we have. And yeah, it makes perfect sense. Like, you absolutely could see how, you know, it is a retcon. They they didn't, that wasn't how it was at the, at the time. But it, yeah, makes perfect sense. And if you do not already know about Dathomir, uh, definitely watch uh, Clone Wars. I'm, I'm pretty sure if you Google Clone Wars Dathomir, it, it's going to tell you exactly what episodes to, to watch. And if you're, if you have Disney Plus, they're all on there. And, uh, yeah, one person says the plot is nonsense, but propulsive. Yeah. Let's see. The second film also undoes one of the more confusing decisions of the first, which was to make Wicket, the only Ewok most Star Wars fans could even name or recognize, a mere side player. That's very true. Here, Davis's rambunctious little scamp is back front and center, hanging with his Endor bestie Sindel, showing off his flawless English. I actually think I like this better one than this one better than the first. The pacing is faster. There's more action. The budget appears to have been higher. Wicket's mouth moves. It even manages to build genuine tension and then skillfully break it with clever laugh out loud comedic moments. Yeah, I gotta say, I this made me chuckle on more than one occasion. I love the stop motion animation of the creatures and the not quite John Williams theme music and how the Ewoks always always work together. One of the sequel's best improvements, aside from better pacing, clearer plotting, and the casting of Diabetes in a major role, is writer-directors Ken and Jim Wheat and writer-executive writer producer George Lucas's decision to let Wicked speak, somewhat choppy, English. If they're not going to subtitle the Ewokies, it's the least they can do. This really, really helps move the plot along. Ilum's primetime Emmy Award-winning special effects, spearheaded by VFX supervisor Michael J. McAllister, reached another level here. Relative to television, that is, it feels like the budget has been boosted a bit. Although Film Corps cannot confirm the price tag for this baby at present, Phil Tippett at this point was too cool to work on these little Ewok movies anymore, so here he is replaced by stop-motion animator Tom St. Amand. The creature quality doesn't suffer in the slightest. The innovative character makeups actually improve, courtesy of Karen Bradley and Kevin Brennan. We get a lot more of them, first of all, than we do in Caravan. Right, and the the Marauders are apparently called Sanyasans. The Sanyasans have a cool, creepy look with Frankenstein monster as hollow cheekbones, deep set zombie eyes, Planet of the Apes style noses, and kiss platform shoes, yeah, and yeah, it's it's very true. It's the one thing about the. I wish that the mouth moved more, more and more naturally, and with more like 
expression, more like, you know, human lips have a large, you know, have, yeah, can move a lot, but the, like, when the, when the, yeah, I don't think I can do it with, with my mouth, but the, yeah, the Sanisans, the Marauders, you know, the, the lips basically just go up and down, which, you know, I get that's obviously easier and cheaper to do when you're doing the kind of, you know, mask thing. And it is nice that at least there is movement there. But it's, I, I wish there was more. However, I really appreciate that the eyes, I sp actually I forget if the Marauders, it's maybe, maybe it's only Terak, but Terak for sure. You can see his eyes, it's clearly Carol Struis, they, they may have like put in like contacts or something, but it's his actual eyes. They're not like, it's not some kind of makeup thing. And, like, you know, as Lurch, he's very friendly and, well, maybe not quite friendly, but he's, he feels, like, not super threatening. But here, he really shows, it was very cool to see this side of, of uh, you know, I, I mean, I've always known he was a great performer. It takes, like, I, I hate when people say, oh, you know, but the, you know, Lurch doesn't even speak. Yeah. And he's still, like, look at his face. Look at... The, the way he smiles and his eyes, there's so much personality there. Try filming yourself. You don't have to show it to anyone, but just, like, watch it back. Try filming something where you're acting, where, you're, where you have detailed lines, and then try filming something where you have to convey a lot, but you aren't allowed to say a word. It is very, very difficult, and Carol Strykin does amazing at it as Lurch, and here, just his eyes, like, the... Yes, he does also speak, but he has a fairly low vocabulary. He's the the character is very simple, you know. But the way that his eyes, like there's such intensity and life there, just yeah, absolutely loved that. Yeah, really, really appreciate that they they did that. That they didn't try to cover the eyes with with something. It just you know, I. I still feel bad for, for Warwick Davis and, you know, all the, the dwarf performance in these, that they have to struggle against these glass eyes that the Ewoks have. Like, I get it. It's cuter than if you show their, their real eyes. An argument could be made. But the, the yeah, it just, it really limits how much they, they can express. The, the eyes are... You know, they're called the windows to the soul for a reason. Now, back to credit quotes. We get skeleton cage wagons pulled by giant stop-motion animated glurgs that look exactly like giant dewbag lizards, but apparently are different. The movie's other sixth stop-motion contribution is a giant winged cave bat slash dragon slash pterodactyl thing that kind of looks like a way better version of Rodan and leads us to a sweet hang glider chase scene that literally bowers from that pterodactyl Raquel Welsh abduction scene in 10,000 years BC. The pacing is so much faster than before, the adventures are still child-oriented, though it helps that Wicket is now nearly fluent in English, avoiding all the high-pitched chatter that previously served as communication, and the villain is genuinely antagonizing, Terak representing evil through his actions, but devoid of any qualities to distinguish him from an average henchman, is still a vast improvement over the animalistic giant the Gorak from the previous film. And the amount of damage and adversity he doles out is considerable. The educational and moral lessons are back, this time including a bit on fire safety, generosity, loneliness, and curiosity. But they're better balanced here by sinister characters, daring rescue attempts, and more severe perils. The raiders even kind of even look kind of like orcs from Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings trilogy, just with less skin boils and more hair. Actress Aubrey Miller is noticeably better this time around, but she still gives the occasional blank stare. Her voice often sounds like she's reading lines more than she's acting. It's a good performance for someone so young. She was seven or eight at the time of filming. Effects are still sketchy, but this is an old film. Heavy use of stop-motion animation, which is really jerky. But again, it adds to the charm, just like the first film. Gotta admit, I love the large dinosaur-like blurbs. A simple yet effective design, which is pure Star Wars. 
Willow pinched the concept, I reckon, even more so with its classic stop-motion animation. Also, the Blurgs are now canon. They appear in uh, Clone Wars and actually in live action uh, on The Mandalorian. So, yeah, that is very, very cool. And... In true Lucasian style, we are given characters that are meant to be cute and therefore funny. However, as I discovered, there was very little difference in the upsetting scale between those characters and the ones meant to represent the evil side. Hmm. I don't know. I don't quite agree with with that one. Anyway, um, Star Wars has always uh, arguably been more fantasy than science fiction. You know, weird western, really. But this is an out-and-out -out magic and sorcery story, the likes of which Lucas would perfect a few years later in Willow. It involves the old... Um, yeah, I think... I want to talk about that, but it's kind of a spoiler, so I will put it in the spoiler section real quick. There we go. Mace Tawani, Eric Walker, also dies in the opening act attack, so does the family's mum, but we only see her corpse in order to avoid paying an actress. Yeah. The Marauders are a group of post-apocalyptic thugs who torch the Ewok village. They look like medieval knights kitted out as Mad Max-style vigilantes, assuming the knights were ape-like aliens, that is. They were apes... Pretending they knew how to ride horses. I, I still can't write, I quite wrap my head around it. The first e Ewok special had a twee Disney vibe, but this is more in keeping with macabre 80s kids' films such as Return to Oz or The Dark Crystal. Yeah. Sindel's family are killed off violently in the first 10 minutes, for example. While there's plenty of old school stop motion monsters, there's basically a general sense of strangeness, which works really well. The production di designer was Joe Johnston, who went on to direct the fun Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. The stylish of the Rocketeer and the terrific Captain America the First Avenger. Avenger? Avenger? And he really went to town on the brutal, twisted, scary look of the bad guys and their trappings. Thankfully, there's also more of a robust plot than Carrying of Courage had. It's both darker and more engaging than that first one. Let's see, the movie's rather bizarre, especially given the young audience it's aimed at. Within a few minutes of the movie beginning, not only are Sindel and Mace's parents killed by marauders, so is Mace himself, even though he was a central character in the first TV movie, and a rather obvious Luke Skywalker substitute down to the casting of a young actor who resembled Mark Hamill. And I think... Yeah, uh, essentially this is... This is like when the Alien franchise did... Let's see... Yeah, you know, hey, you know how everything... You know, everything that was accomplished in last movie, it was worthless because most of the people involved got killed right after. Save a bunch of captured Ewoks, never mind why Terak and Sheral need Ewoks, since they really don't seem to care much about them one way or the other. I appreciate what they tried to do here, give the story some gravitas, create an ensemble of interesting characters on a quest, reaching, risking everything for each other, etc, etc. It just doesn't work, and the charm from the previous movie is not to be found in this one, at least not as strongly. Yeah, I, I don't quite agree with that last part either. But yeah, it gets, it gets very close to something like Willow or, or Lord of the Rings or something. Now, I'm not going to give away whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending, but the ending fits with what came before. I think the ending is pretty good. Right, and the opening is also, like, the the first, like, two or three minutes are going to make it seem like it's just this light-hearted little thing like the first one was, and then it gets serious, and, yeah. Now, the... I think I've pretty much said everything that I wanted to make sure. I did want... Oh, cool. So, okay, so her f full original name is 
yeah, she, Jane Elizabeth Alwyn Phillips, and she's a dame. Very cool. She's known professionally as Sean Phillips, and yeah, she does amazing as the witch. Just, yeah, um, I think that is pretty much all I'm going to say about the characters in addition to what I've already said. And yeah, so the dialogue, the dialogue isn't bad, honestly. The, the you know, the, the villains don't necessarily, like, they, they, they have a fairly one-track mind, like, Tarak seems to care about nothing else at all than this power. And, uh, yeah, Sharal is constantly trying to unlock the power for him and for her own sake. But the the good guy characters, like, there's just enough there that you get a sense of who the various characters are. And, yeah, there are 11 entries in the IMDb quote section. And, yeah, if you like the movie, all 11 of them are good. Now, that brings us to the cinematography, which is good, like, not amazing, but for, for a TV production, it's it's good. And, oh, that's right, yeah, they're actually, oh, oh here we go. Wow, I completely missed it, there we go. Yes, the it was handled by Isidore Mankowski, R.I.P. He, he DP'd 100 different things. The most recent was actually released in 2021, which was also the year he passed. And yeah, he's done a lot of TV stuff and yeah, um, other kids stuff, including Parent Trap 3. Wow. How'd they make three of those? Holy crap. Um, Carrie, holy, yeah, very impressive. Um, yeah, he he does well for working on a on a TV budget here. There's a good like all of the action is filmed in a way that makes it very clear what's going on and how things. You know, a, a lot of the action is this kind of thing. You know, there's a lot of like projectile kind of stuff, so or stuff thrown. So you'll have a shot of someone like getting the the what what are those called again? And anyway, yeah, throwing or, or shooting something, and then it'll cut to someone or something being hit by that thing. So it's extremely important that it's filmed in a way that it's easy for the audience to tell those two shots, you know, one of them leads to the other, you know, and it might sound obvious, it might sound very, you know, it is very basic, but there are some action direct, you know, some, some action movies, the cinematography doesn't completely get it across, and the movie is, is you know, those kinds of movies really suffer under that. The editing was handled by Eric Jenkins, who has edited 20 different titles. This is not the only TV thing he has done. And yeah, some other kid stuff, including Malcolm in the Middle and Lizzie McGuire. And yeah, um, fares well for, for TV editing, TV movie editing. And that is about what I have to say about that. Um, they get good use out of the location shooting. You know, again, a lot of it is filmed in the the forest near, you know, I want to say it's the California Redwoods. And, yeah. Um, at the end of the day, it is just a forest. But it feels more real than, uh, you know, 
if it was a lot of like green screen. Now, uh, let's see, that brings us to, yeah, so the the length here, this is 93 minutes if you don't count the end credits, 97 if you do count them, and yeah, I would definitely say, like, it, you get a strong sense of what the movie is from very, very early on. If you're not 100% sure, like, if you'd like a number, I would say give it maybe the first 35 minutes. If by then you really don't care about anything, then, you know, if you don't want to, if you don't care if you see what happens with the, the characters and events after that, yeah, you can, you can turn it off. It's, I'm not sure there's anything after that so that's really going to change that. Now, the best element... Yeah, it's a it's a tie. You know the the special effects, the the just adventure tone, like the way that this really does feel like. I mean, you could sit down and watch this even if you don't know anything about Star Wars. If you just like this kind of quest story, you know. And, yeah, honestly, Wilford Brimley, his his presence in this, I, I really didn't think, you know, I mean, yeah, it's not, like, the thing. It's not as, it's not on that level, but it's a really good performance, nevertheless. Now, I suppose the worst aspect is probably the the stuff that's related to the, the budget, you know, the, the effects not quite being as, you know, yeah, quite as good. And, yeah, the something I, I saw a lot of other reviews say was, like, the worst thing was the bad acting. And, yeah, I th the thing I was most worried about, I, I knew going in that it would undo most of the first movie, in the opening, so I was a little worried that it was going to be difficult to get into because of that, but that wasn't the case. It, for, for me, it might be for, for others. And the thing I was most looking forward to was seeing that awesome sword on the cover in action, and yeah, there is some pretty good stuff of, of that. Yeah. This and Willow, the villains have really, really cool swords. Now, the trailer does give at least a little too much away, but also gives you a decent idea of what the movie is like. The cover and poster don't give too much away, but they just don't expect absolutely everything on the cover and poster to actually... Actually, yeah, tell you what, it's not really a spoiler to say. Um, if you look at the cover and poster, there's... There's a dude standing there with like a blaster, looks very determined. Yeah, he's barely in the movie. That's that's the father who dies, you know, a few minutes in. So I mean, I guess they felt, you know, if we put Wilford Brimley on there, that's not gonna sell that people are not gonna go for that. But just yeah. Um It's a it's a choice. It's definitely a choice. And that brings us to the Rotten Tomatoes, where it does not even have a critic score because there are only three critic reviews. Um, yeah, uh, two rotten and one fresh. And <laughs> yeah, um, both of the rotten ones do admit that it's better than the first one. And, yeah, the, the one fresh review says, uh, you know, the opening and ending are, uh, you know, great. And, yeah, the, the audience score is 51%. So, yeah, t more than 10,000 ratings. The average rating is 3.3 .3 out of 5. Anything below 3.5 is a downvote. And it is... Wow, I actually forgot that it's not even on. 
It's not on Metacritic at all. Wow. There's, there's like mobile games that no one has played for years on Metacritic, but this isn't there. On IMDB, it, there are 53 user reviews, or 44 if you hide spoilers. And yeah, I read all of them. And of the of all of them, let's see, five of them gave it one out of ten, one gave it two, two gave it three, three gave it four, two gave it five, six gave it six, seven gave it seven, five gave it eight, eight gave it nine, seven, seven gave it ten. So yeah, fairly fairly mixed, but a little bit more that liked it than than didn't. And yeah, so the, the special effects I've already said most of what I want to but but yeah they they do a pretty good job like there's some stuff you know if you know what if you have a lot of experience watching 80s movies with that are special effects heavy you're going to be able to to figure out how they did basically everything in this but the movie is made for kids you know and for kids like there's a lot it it does a lot really well you know the some of the designs are probably at least a little too scary for kids but yeah i mean i i realized that in the 80s some of the stuff that was sold as like 80 as, as kids you know entertainment was very dark and and such so yeah uh, there's some pretty good stunt work. There's not a lot of graphic violence, but some of what there is, yeah, very, very effective. And that brings us to, yeah, on, on Disney Plus, uh, there are no special features. And... Right, and, and if you care about Star Wars, you know, Disney Plus, like, you know, make sure to, to check if you don't already have it, but some places around the world, Disney Plus has pretty much everything Star Wars. Like, I've, I think the only Star Wars thing that isn't on Disney Plus that, like, at all could be is, like, the entirety of the the holiday special you know there's like one s nine minute the, the animated segment and right now it's looking like I'll probably do a video on the animated segment I'm guessing it'll be exactly a week from now certainly next week is is the plan but yeah uh, I give this seven Ewok battles out of ten I was not expecting to give it more than a five but yeah and it is definitely the kind of thing like I already mentioned that for some kids it'll be too dark, but yeah, other than that, I mean, if this wasn't Star Wars, I wouldn't have watched it, but now knowing that it exists, yeah, honestly, I could see myself sitting down and watching this again. Um, and, like, this is one of those things, you know, if you watched it as a kid and you're wondering, does it hold up? Yeah, there's a pretty decent chance that you'll still like it. You know, may maybe not. It's, it's the kind of thing... If you're watching, if you're rewatching something that you have like nostalgia for, you know, make sure to to you know just keep in mind it was a different time. It was, you know, they made things differently back then, and there's maybe other stuff that, you know, maybe you were watching it with someone that you really like spending time with, kind of thing. But yeah, a lot of it does really work. Um, yeah, so the updated ranking. And and keep in mind this is of which I just realized I didn't say at the at the start, but yeah, this ranking is not I'm not saying that the Ewok movies like if you're just looking at like production value, they'd be at the very bottom. I'm ranking them based on how much I enjoyed watching them compared to the other Star Wars movies, all of which are better produced than these two. But yeah, um, episode 2319, Ewok 1, episode 6, Ewok 2, Solo, episode 7, Rogue 1, episodes 4, 5, and 8. And that brings us to the thoughts section. So let's start 
with the uh, notes taken while watching. And yeah, as usual, on paper. So the first, like the very, very opening, you know, Sindel is like skipping and picking flowers and Wicked is like doing the, the what are they called, Som somersault kind of thing, you know, a handstand that moves into a, an, another move. Is like tra la 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 la. I'm so happy my family isn't dead. And you know, Sindel has to. You know, she's she's thinking. You know, eventually, you know, go go home. Yes, yeah, she, yes, yeah, she talks about going home at the start, and then her family dies. But she does go home at the at the very end. Good bit of good writing decision to have it brought up at the very start. Uh, you know, preparing the kids in the audience for the no good goodbye and. You know, yeah, she explains, you know, me and Mace have to learn things, uh, you know, we have to go to school. It's where we'll learn how to be good cogs in the capitalist machine. And, you know, Sindel is like, you know, maybe you could come with me. And he's like, no, Ewok live here. Glass eyes belong on Endor. And... Yeah, and, and we get the attack from the Marauders. Yeah, very, very cool. Really nicely done. Very intense and, and like, affecting. And with his dying breath, you know, the, the father, Paul Gleason's character, gives the, the Marauders two weeks' detention. And... Yeah, you know, kind of clever how they sneak out of the wagon and it's this thing with, you know, the rest of the Ewoks are too big to fit through the hole. And, yeah, like the, you know, when they when they drop out of the wagon, I was like, oh, okay, so this is how they go. Nope, they get spotted and, like, followed and these marauders fire blaster guns at them. You know, and they have to, like, walk on the like on the on the side of a mountain to get you know just super very very tense and you know they manage to to get in through this little tiny crack that they can you know it's just big enough for them to to pass through and the marauders because they so eagerly fire their blasters they cause this like what's it called a landslide or something i guess it's not an avalanche when there's no snow involved Let's see and yeah really really cool with the the flying the pterodactyl thing and you know wicked follows on the 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 glider and drops a rock on it and then you know it drops sindel so the glider has to go under and sindel hits the the top of the glider so you know goes through so they they crash and they have a bit of a meet cute with Cheek, where Cheek tries to rob them in their sleep. That's, yeah. And let's see. yeah, and and the yeah, they follow Cheek to the the house, thinking it's been left behind. And then they do this thing where like the you know, they, they try to clean up the, the place thinking it's been abandoned and Teak does like nothing to challenge the, you know, the challenge their thinking that, uh, which is a choice. And Noah does, you know, I don't think we see it, but he does say, you know, I'll deal with you after because he does realize, you know, Teak was the one who brought, is Teak always doing this? Why is Noah so sure that Teak was the one who did? Like, oh my god, what happened to the other ones? Moving on. Um, right, and yeah, so we meet Noah without an H, which I did hilariously see one like user review just freak out over. There's nothing like a sheltered Christian. 
Uh, let's see. And yeah, we you know we hear the thing with you know Noah doesn't want to have any friends, and we later do understand it's because he's afraid of losing them, like Salak, I think his name was. And you know, Sin yeah, Sindel is is like freezing. I'm cold. I know. Do you know how I know? Because we're connected. And they are eventually let into the house. And yeah, very intense nightmare. Really, really nicely done. But you know, she thinks, oh, you know, Noah can help. But then it's uh, uh, Terak in the bed. Just, yeah. And they're gonna make flower pie, which I feel like is just one single step up from floor pie. And oh god, Wicked says Star Cruiser again. At least it's not as many times and as annoying as it was in the first one. What are you doing? You're not supposed to be out here. I've got worse traps than these out here. What are you fighting? The Predator? And I don't like criticizing child actors or child singers. I will just say that if you are putting one in your movie that is not that good of an actor, not that good of a singer, maybe don't ask them to act a lot or to sing. And yeah, the, the um, Sheral sings the song. And I think, you know, various, you know, I listened to a, a num listen, yeah, yeah, I mostly listened to. Some of them were like podcasts, some of them I plugged into the TTS reader. Anyway, listened to a lot of reviews. Various people have already guessed. Sh Sheral must have heard the, the singing. And yeah, I, th I think that makes a lot of sense. And it is, of course, there's a, you know, there are a number of fairy tales where, like, an, an evil woman of, of some kind, often a witch, will use the, the weakness of a child against them. And, you know, they, they happen to know that children like this or that particular thing. And, yeah, and we get a, yeah, Noah realizes that Sindel is gone. And we get a brief montage of him, like, preparing for war, which if someone hasn't already, like, put the commando score over that, it really needs to happen. Like, immediately I thought of, like, they're the, literally the same year. You know, this was, like, and I'm not saying it's the only, these are the only two movies that do this, but just the fact that it's in this kids movie and also in this, you know, really you know, yeah. I guess not the most violent of, of like the 80s action movies, but an, uh, you know, an 80s action movie made specifically for like teenagers and adults, so yeah. And let's see, then we have yeah, um... When we think of Wilfred Brimley, we think immediately of, of three things. The first is, of course, diabetes. The second is Quaker Oats. And the third is Action Hero. And, yeah, he, he like, goes full Action Hero in the last chunk of this with, like, a, a rope that he then, you know, and, like, Various reviewers, as you know, various reviewers joke that as he's walking up the the, you know, it's very like the the Batman, you know, the the Adam West show, you know, he's he's just walking up the just yeah, and yeah, so they they see the the hall full of drinking and drunk marauders and. You know, there, there is so, so yeah. Our, our, 
fellowship are trying to figure out how to how to get past all of these and I guess the marauders are drinking to a lack of peripheral vision like it's fascinating that they can't at all see these these people that like just have like one of them like peeking out around a corner but no they're just standing there like barely concealed and then they actually do the three kids in a trench coat routine complete with like wicked standing on top of you know and like covering Noah's eyes by accident just yeah amazing and yeah I I will admit I kind of chuckled when you know Teak goes for the keys and like the marauder sits on Teak's hand and it just yeah it's it's kind of funny and the the thing with the the card cheating that was actually kind of clever a little bit of because like you you get immediately you know obviously you know if, if one of the marauders because like Teak puts a, a card in the in the sleeve of one of the card playing marauders so when he lifts his hand to, to continue playing the card slips out and the other one is willing to shoot him over cheating at cards which like I said, Weird West, you know, it's right out of a, a Western. And obviously, the one who, you know, instead of protesting, instead of saying, I wasn't cheating, I don't know who put that car there, he raises his gun, and they both shoot each other. And, like, nobody, and, and like, the rest of the Mead Hall, like, looks over, it's like, ah, car cheats, what are you going to do? You know, just, like, well, um... Could somebody please carry them out of here before they start smelling? And yeah, um, reset the sign. Zero days since the last time someone shot another over cheating at cards. Like this, this, this is a pretty common occurrence. And and yeah, they free Sindel and the Ewoks. And then before they can unlock the cage that Charles, Char uh, Charles is in, Sindel says, not her, she's evil. Which, I mean, that, yeah, that's a, that's a pretty... Because, like, she already knows that if you stay, like, they, this is a dungeon where they'll keep you until you are a skeleton. You know, so, so yeah, she really does not. But it's this, it's, she, she is, she has no mercy in her heart. Beware the reign of, of Blood Queen Sindel. But, on the other hand, it is this kind of thing of like, it would be so frustrating if the good guys did unlock the cage. Because that's, it happens in a lot of these stories. The, the good guys will let out the bad guy, and then the bad guy, of course, you know, betrays them. And, yeah, I mean, sh um, basically, Sharal and Tarak are in a toxic relationship. Like, Best I can figure, maybe she needs the, the shelter, maybe can... I can imagine she might be able to get her own food. But it is, I mean, it is a dangerous place. The, these two movies make very clear Endor is a dangerous place to live. And it was kind of funny. It, it made me chuckle when, like, one of the marauders, like, gets shot in the foot... And then, like, others step on his foot, and he's just like, oh, it hurts so much. It's just, I can't, I can't replicate the noise he makes, but, you know, in, in English, it means, oh, it hurts so much. And it's very, very funny. And, yeah, cool battle at the climax. I mean, it very, very Return of the Jedi, but, like I said, you know, it doesn't, like, though that one does kind of bug me, it it doesn't really hear. Mm, they're they're marauders. They also don't have technology. 
and yeah we see use of a catapult and there's like blasters on the ship just yeah and and it's very surreal watching Ewoks use blasters and other tech you know it it is like they are supposed to be like the Viet Cong they always have been supposed to be like that which you know that's that's part of why it's always bugged me that they don't use weapons in Return of the Jedi, which is, you know, that was where they especially were supposed to be, like Viet Cong fighting the Empire, which Lucas has explicitly said that's, you know, the Empire or the stand in for America. And yeah, seeing them actually really, like, it's, it's wild for, you know, it does not. Like, as far as canon goes, it's pretty ridiculous that, the, you know, they're here, they're just using it with with Glee, and then, you know, Return of the Jedi is set after this, and there they're, like, you know, wowed by, you know, various technology that just, yeah, that... And and it's the, it's the thing of, you know, if you just, if you removed Wicket, or, like... I get, actually, yeah, if just if you say that Wicked, maybe it takes a really long time for a child Ewok to grow into an adult, because Ewok, it, Wicked is definitely still a child in Return of the Jedi. He behaves like a, a child. You know, there are Ewoks who are much more patient and mature than, than Wicked is in, in Return of the Jedi. But apparently Lucas himself has said, no, 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 this is set... I, I believe both of these Ewok movies are set between the the Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi, which would mean that the Empire is like somewhere on, or or I guess maybe they'll arrive on the planet any day now, and it's like, well, why why do they have such trouble with, you know, why, why are they so wowed by technology when the rebels show up? Anyway. And... You know, the one thing for, for like, action hero status, Noah does need to work on his one-liners. You won't be bothering me no more! Just, it's not quite, you know, remember when I said I'd kill you last? I lied. You know, that's, uh, just, yeah. Remember when I said you could have the last bowl of Quaker Oats? I lied. Something like that. We, we can workshop it, is what I'm saying. And, <laughs> you know, Terak manages to capture Sindel again. She's really good at that. She is a capture magnet in these movies. And, you know, at least in the first one, the capture magnet effect she had only attracted Ewoks. But yeah, in you know, and and Noah comes and he's like, okay, here's the, yeah, you know, here's the power source. I have the power, just to get that out of the way. You know, I'll fight. You know, if you release Sindel, I'll fight you over the power source. And just yeah, it's it's pretty amazing. It's it's everything I hoped it would be, and just yeah. Um, I mean, I I just. Just to, just to, you know, the, the movie's from 1985. When they filmed it, Wilford Brimley must have been 50 or 51. Uh, right, R.I.P. I don't, I don't know why I forgot that he had passed. That's, yeah, and, and, you know, he's, he's this, you know... Yeah, it's just, it's pretty amazing watching him fight Carol Strykin, and I really want to know what material that walking stick is made out of, because, you know, at first I thought, oh, I guess maybe Tarak's sword just isn't that sharp, but no, it cuts right through a branch that is thicker than the walking staff, so just, yeah... And let's see. Then the yeah, the the ring lands on 
Or wait, n n uh, hold on. Yeah, he took the ring from Sheral, which now means that she can't turn back into a human. But yeah, um, it gets hit and like... I, I don't know if it's supposed to be like a, a countermeasure or or some kind of but you know it yeah he 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 just burns Tarak just absolutely yeah there's a, yeah parents guide po says you know near the end one scene in particular may seem a bit gory to some when one character is burned to a crisp yeah um it's it's a it's a lot and I'm I'm here for it. It's amazing. This like more of of these should should end like this. That's that's a pretty yeah. And yeah, you know, Noah with with the powers, you know, he's now able to fix the the Star Cruiser. And you know, he's he's gonna fly off and he you know he makes a very personal goodbye to Wicket you know I'm I'm you're a brave little warrior and I'm better off for knowing you uh, that goes for the rest of you as well you know I which fair enough there's a lot of Ewoks making a personal goodbye to every single one of them would take a while but Teak also stays behind which I don't understand um right sorry it's just no, obviously, it's because while Teak does have a friendly relationship with Noah, who's leaving, he has no relationship at all with the vast majority of the Ewoks, so he should stay with them. Just, it's, it's a, it's a choice. It's a, it's mystifying, is what it is. And then... Right, and just, yeah, one critic quote, the, you know, one person noted that the movie involves the old standing on someone's shoulders and using a long coat to disguise the fact that there are two of you trick. And yeah, um, let me know which, in, in the comments, which is your favorite of these two and what's the, yeah, what's your favorite creature, what's your favorite effect? And which is creepier, the the glassy eyes of Ewoks or the barely moving mouth of Tarak? And yeah, if you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page. Once you want more links to stuff like relevant playlists, I suggest a video for you to watch on screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week, reviewing and sharing small thoughts on a movie. And one talking about my spoilerful thoughts on the most recent episode of The Bear, one or that I've personally gotten around to watching of The Bear, one for the most recent episode I've personally gotten around to watching of Scream Queens. I do a daily video talking about two episodes of the 1990s X Men animated series. And as soon as a new MCU and or Star Wars thing hits Disney Plus, I'll do that. And recently the Ruin Thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if more videos like this you're in luck, you can check out my back channels. Let's catch my next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording. And I'll catch you next time. May the force be with you.